Welcome back, students of ancient provincial religions and cult practices. Today we look a bit more closely at the spread of Christianity and the reasons for the growing hostility of the pagan Roman state to Christianity. Why was Christianity offensive to pagans in ways that other religions were not? We will also review some of Christianity's competitors, as well as the syncretization of religions or combinations of old and new. As always, there was a lot going on across the empire. The spread of Christianity, however, also leads to a natural question. Was paganism in decline? Why would Christianity have spread if people were satisfied with their ancestral religious practices? All in good time, students. Christianity escaped close notice in its earliest phases because, for all practical purposes, it was a stream of Judaism, which was itself a legally permissible ancestral practice, a religio licita. With the abandonment of the requirement, however, that Gentile converts also adhere to Mosaic law, Gentiles would come to outnumber Jews, who in their turn would not recognize as Jews converts who failed to follow Mosaic law. Nevertheless, the cover of Judaism was useful for early Christians until it wasn't. Unrest in Judea was on the rise, as was Roman irritation at proselytes. We possess an obscure reference in the life of Claudius, where Suetonius writes, He banished from Rome all the Jews, who were continually making disturbance at the instigation of one Crestus. The Romans could not really tell them apart. By the 60s of the first century CE, however, the Christians had caught the eye of the Roman authorities as a distinct religious group. The historian Tacitus, our only authority, who reports the first persecution of Christians, presents it as a way for the Emperor Nero to find someone to punish after the great fire of Rome in 64 CE. Tacitus tells us that of Rome's 14 districts, just four were left intact. Three districts were leveled to the ground, and the rest suffered devastating losses with huge loss of life. Because Nero aimed to use the tragedy as an opportunity for redesigning the city, and the erection of grandiose buildings, including a new golden house for himself, people accused him of setting the fire deliberately. A disaster of this magnitude was officially treated as a demonstration of divine wrath. There had been some breach of the truce with the gods, or the Pax Deorum. Traditional religious methods were employed in order to determine what remedies might avail to propitiate the gods. Tacitus tells us that recourse was had to the Sibylline books by the direction of which prayers were offered to Vulcanus, Ceres, and Proserpina. Juno, too, was entreated by the matrons, first in the capital, then on the nearest part of the coast, whence water was procured to sprinkle the fane and image of the goddess. And there were sacred banquets and nightly vigils celebrated by married women. But all human efforts, all the lavish gifts of the emperor, and the propitiations of the gods did not banish the sinister belief that the conflagration was the result of an order from Nero. Nero blamed the Christians, and Tacitus' description of the sect is well worth quoting as it is our earliest description by a traditionally religious Roman. Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, in a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Tacitus displays the typical arrogance of Rome's ruling class toward the religion of the lower classes and provincials. Christianity is a mischievous superstition. 
the Christians were rounded up and convicted. Nero aimed to make their punishments exemplary. Again, according to Tacitus, mockery of every sort was added to the deaths of the Christians, covered with the skins of beasts. They were torn by dogs and perished or were nailed to crosses or were doomed to the flames and burned to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Nero offered his gardens for the spectacle and was exhibiting a show in the circus while he mingled with the people in the dress of a charioteer or stood aloft in a chariot. Apparently, Nero's efforts backfired, and instead of inspiring a feeling of vindicated satisfaction at the punishment of the perpetrators, Popular opinion sympathized with the Christians who became victims, tortured for the sake of Nero's cruelty. This first persecution, which seems opportunistic, nevertheless reveals some fundamental elements that will target Christians for similar persecutions in the future. The origin of their religion was Judea, but they were not Jews. Their religion was thus illicit. As converts to a monotheism, they had abandoned ancestral religious traditions as well as participation in the worship of the wider community. By the logic of traditional religion, this breach would have angered the gods who had previously received their worship and thus ruptured the truce that the state strove to maintain with potentially angry deities, the Pax Deorum. Consultation of the Sibylline books was undertaken in just such circumstances. Efforts to propitiate such traditional deities as Vulcanus, Ceres, Proserpine, and Juno also underscore this assumption that the gods are angry. Tacitus also tells us that the Christians were not convicted so much for the crime of arson as hatred of humankind, odio humani generis. This is a key point. Whether they set fires or not, Christians would be held culpable. In what sense did Christians hate the human race? Christians openly declared that the gods worshipped by others were evil demons, and they refused to participate in the community ceremonies that kept the peace with the gods and thus ensured the safety of the state and the community. What could motivate people to behave in this way, except their utter contempt for their neighbors, their rulers, and the immortal gods. The very existence of Christians was thus a standing religious offense to the immortal gods. Their presence was both criminal and dangerous for the community, at least according to the logic of traditional religious thought. The early Christian apologist, Tertullian, complains to the point, writing, the pagans suppose that the Christians are the cause of every public disaster, every misfortune that happens to the people. If the Tiber overflows or the Nile does not, if there is a drought or an earthquake, a famine or a pestilence, at once the shout goes up, throw the Christians to the lions. The situations that Tertullian describes are analogous to the Great Fire of 64. Godless hatred of the human race according to this logic, has consequences because floods, earthquakes, fires, plague, and famine are precisely those disasters that arise when the gods are angry. Some may protest or chafe at the use of the word godless to describe the Christians, as they worship the god whom they considered the one true god. You will recall that atheism was also among the charges leveled against Socrates. He did not worship the gods that the state worshipped. To deny aggressively the existence of the gods was, to the pagan mind, manifestly godless as well as unsocial. There was an additional charge against Christians. They were stubborn, obstinate, and disobedient when offered the chance to repent and display their loyalty. Roman magistrates wielded strong coercive authority. To disobey a magistrate was a serious offense. Just as those who disobey the orders of armed police officers in today's United States do so at the risk of their lives, the lower classes of Rome disobeyed the command of a magistrate at their peril. For those who did not confess freely, 
a sacrifice test was developed to determine whether someone was, in fact, a Christian. The test was simple. A fire was burning on an altar. When asked to offer a sacrifice to the gods of the Romans, an individual was required to throw some incense upon the flames of that fire. Accused Christians could prove their innocence by rejoining the human race and offering this simple sacrifice. Many did so and escaped, with their earthly lives at least. Others, however, refused. The magistrate could then repeat the request as a command. Continued refusal was akin to contempt of court in a society where obedience to authority was demanded and expected, especially of the lower classes. Persecution may have been logical, but it did not occur frequently or for very long periods of time. Roman authorities preferred to look the other way and offer an escape. We have already discussed Nero's persecution of 64 CE. Before 64, any Christian martyrs were too closely integrated with contemporary Judaism for us to distinguish between the two religions. The sacrifice test emerged in the early 100s, and reports of occasional martyrs are sporadic until the reign of the Emperor Decius, who issued a decree in 249 that citizens had to obtain a certificate, libellus in Latin, that attested to their participation in public sacrifice. This was the first empire-wide persecution. Some Christians hired others to perform the sacrifice for them. Others simply did what was required. These were the lapsi, those who had slipped or lapsed Christians. And some were, of course, martyred. This persecution ended in a year. A more sustained persecution took place along the same lines and lasted years during the reign of Diocletian, beginning in 302. It ended only with the death of Diocletian in 313. And by 324, Christianity would be the preferred religion of the empire after the conversion of the emperor Constantine. When we look closely at the persecution of Christians, we find that they were sporadic, and with the exceptions of those under Decius and Diocletian, neither empire-wide nor sustained. In the instances of Decius and Diocletian, there was a solid religious logic behind the drive for demonstrations of civic loyalty through religion. Both emperors attempted to quell military anarchy and insurrection, which served, of course, as demonstrations of divine anger. Reinstating civil peace, however, required loyalty and obedience to the authority of the emperor, which was best demonstrated through participation in the public sacrifices offered to the gods of the state and the divinity of the emperor. To refuse would be the rough equivalent of refusing to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the U.S. flag in a time of national emergency, except that one also thereby demonstrated godless hatred of the human race as well as obstinate sedition. These efforts, as we will discuss in our final lecture, were spectacularly unsuccessful. Was paganism in decline? Did people simply cease to believe in the old gods? The evidence is overwhelming that traditional religion and ancient gods retained their attractive powers in the hearts of the majority in Italy and Rome, which long remained stubbornly pagan. And for those who wanted more than tradition, there were other new religions that were compatible with polytheism and offered benefits similar to those promised by Christianity. Some of these religions were also, for a time, serious competitors to Christianity. The later Roman Empire was, moreover, an age of syncretism, an era when religions combined and blended gods and elements from different traditions. Such syncretism was, in many respects, the natural result of Rome's conquests, as well as the granting of Roman citizenship in 212 CE to all free inhabitants of the empire. The disparate realms, city-states, and peoples were gradually growing together religiously. 
In the beginning, there was the worship of Rome and the Roman emperor, but other religious forms became both more common as well as more widespread. We have already had occasion to mention Isis, the great goddess of Egypt, who had arrived with Osiris, but called Serapis, already in the second century BCE. Fast forward three centuries, and we find evidence of devotion to Isis from the British Isles to Asia Minor. We are also fortunate to possess, in the single complete Latin novel that survives from antiquity, the story of a man's initiation into the mysteries of Isis. This novel, entitled The Metamorphoses, that is, The Transformations, or alternatively, The Golden Ass, was written by an author, Apuleius, who himself personifies the cultural syncretism of the Roman Empire and whose surviving works offer testimony of the religious currents of his time. A native of Numidia, an area that is now shared between Algeria and Tunisia, Apuleius' native language was Punic, a Semitic language of North Africa. The son of a local magistrate, he studied Greek philosophy in Athens and Latin rhetoric and oratory in Rome, although before he studied oratory, he had to learn Latin. Apuleius thus composed his surviving works, all of which are in Latin, in a language that was not his native tongue. Apuleius traveled widely in Italy, Greece, and Asia Minor, and he acquired a deep knowledge of the religious cults on offer. He tells us that he was initiated into the mysteries of Dionysus, as well as the Eleusinian mysteries of Demeter. During his travels, he became sick on the way to Alexandria and was cared for in a town called Ia in Libya at the house of a friend, Pontianus, with whom he had become acquainted when they were both students in Athens. Pontianus's mother was wealthy, and what is especially important for this story to make sense, she was legally her own person. This legal independence meant that she could dispose of her wealth as she saw fit. Women acquired this right more easily under the empire, especially after Augustus attempted to promote the birth rate among the ruling classes by granting women full legal personhood after bearing three children. Traditionally, women could only make use of their wealth with the approval of male guardians. Apuleius's friend's mother, Pudentilla, was, however, not only rich and legally independent, she was, by the time Apuleius landed on a sickbed in her house, a widow. Upon his recovery, Apuleius married Pudentilla. Apuleius was young, and Pudentilla was old enough to be his mother. She admitted to 40 years. Her male relatives claimed that she was actually 60, and they were incensed at the thought that so much family wealth was now poised to pass out of their family. They filed a criminal complaint, charging that Apuleius had won the widow's affections through charms and magic spells. Such charges had always been serious, and they would remain serious charges throughout the history of the empire. Before we laugh, we may note that trials for witchcraft and sorcery continued to take place in Europe throughout the Middle Ages and occurred fairly regularly through the mid-18th century. Charges of sorcery remain common in various parts of the world even today. The ancient world is really not that long ago. But to return to our author, Apuleius delivered a speech in his own defense, his apology. It survives and it was successful. Apuleius, who appears to have worked for a time in Rome as a lawyer, settled in Carthage, which had been rebuilt by the Romans, and served as a priest in the local cult of the Roman emperor. From the mystery religions of the Eastern Mediterranean to the state religion of Rome to Greek philosophy, Apuleius was an erudite student, and anyone interested in the religious atmosphere of the times has an excellent resource in his novel, the Metamorphoses, or Golden Ass. The book tells the story of one Lucius, an educated upper-class citizen of the Roman Empire who, during his travels, is transformed through magical potions and spells into what Americans call a donkey, 
but which English speakers have more traditionally called an ass. This transformation is both literal and figurative. The young man is asinine in many respects. To undo the spell and regain his human form, Lucius must eat roses. This is easier said than done. Before he can obtain the antidote, Lucius is stolen by a band of robbers. Lucius, the ass, is thus launched on a journey, an odyssey as it were, and we are permitted to observe through his ass's eyes all levels of society, civic life, religious life, magical practices, and eventually his initiation into the cult of Isis. Toward the end of the novel, Lucius has a vision of the goddess Isis, whom at first he does not recognize. Apuleius describes the vision. There appeared to me from the midst of the sea a divine and venerable face, worshipped even of the gods themselves. I seemed to see the whole figure of her body, bright and mounting out of the sea and standing before me. First, she had a great abundance of hair flowing and curling, dispersed and scattered about her divine neck. On the crown of her head she bore many garlands in interlaced with flowers, and in the middle of her forehead was a plain circlet in fashion of a mirror, or rather resembling the moon by the light that it gave forth." The description is much, much longer than that, but this will give you the flavor. Interesting here is the syncretism or conflation of so many gods that Apuleius's Isis provides when she introduces herself to the ass Lucius, who summoned her with his prayer. She tells him, Behold, Lucius, I am come. Thy weeping and thy prayer hath moved me. I am she who is the natural mother of all things, mistress and governess of all the elements, the original offspring of worlds, chief of the powers divine, queen of all who are in the underworld, the first of those who dwell in the heavens, manifested alone and under one form of all the gods and goddesses. At my will, the planets of the sky, the fresh winds of the seas, and the lamentable silences of the underworld are arranged. My name, my divinity, is adored throughout all the world in diverse manners, according to various customs, and by many names. The Frisians call me the mother of the gods at Piscinus. The Athenians call me Minerva. The people of Cyprus, Venus. The Cretans, Diana. The Sicilians, Infernal Proserpina. The Eleusinians call me their ancient goddess Ceres. Some call me Juno. Others, Bologna. Others, Hecate. Others, Ramnusia. But above all, the Ethiopians, who dwell in the east and are illuminated by the morning rays of the sun, and the Egyptians, who excel in all kinds of ancient wisdom and who by the appropriate religious ceremonies are accustomed to worship me, they do call me by my true name, Queen Isis. Isis, in short, lays claim not only to the title of almost every great mother goddess of the Mediterranean, she also claims to be the one true god who appears under many names. We see in her teachings, too, the influence of the moral aspect of religion demanded by such philosophers as Plato and instituted in their religions by Egyptians, Zoroastrians, Jews, and others. Isis tells Lucius that she will return him to human form, but he must dedicate himself to her. Be ready and attentive to my commandment. Be ready always to serve me as long as thou shalt live, since it is by my means and benevolence that thou shalt become human again. Thou shalt live blessed in this world, thou shalt live glorious by my guidance and protection, and when, after thine allotted space of life, thou descendest to the underworld, there thou shalt see me in that subterranean firmament shining in the darkness of Acheron, and reigning in the deep profundity of Styx, and thou shalt worship me as one that hath been favorable to thee. And if I perceive that thou art obedient to my commandment and addicted to my religion, meriting by thy constant chastity my divine grace, Know then that I alone may prolong thy days beyond the time that the fates have appointed and ordained. 
Worship of Isis is the total package. She demands moral conduct in this life, she assists her devotees in this world, and she prepares a place for them in the afterlife. She is also Catholic, in the sense of all-embracing. Although she lays claim to be the one true God, she has no objections to diverse forms of worship. She is thus compatible with the state religion. Also popular during the later Roman Empire, especially among soldiers, was Mithras. Small groups worshipped together in caves or in underground chambers. We have evidence for some 400 such meeting spots. The origins of Mithras are obscure, but many see in his worship a Roman adaptation of Zoroastrianism, although we are so poorly instructed in details that it is difficult to know. Mithras seems to have arrived in Rome during the first century BCE, but his worship began to spread in the first century CE under the Emperor Vespasian, whom we met when he was sent to crush the Jewish revolt in 66. Worship of Mithras remained strong through the fourth century CE. Both the emperors Nero and Commodus were initiated. Central to the religious lore of the cult was the slaughter of bulls, many depictions of which survive. Mithras slaughtered the bull at the behest of the sun, which led to creation. Like Ahura Mazda, Mithras fought an everlasting struggle against evil, and at the end of time was destined to return to the earth. Those who were initiated had to be baptized and confirmed, and the central act of worship was a sacred meal. Mithras was also sometimes identified with Jupiter, another sky god, as well as with the unconquered sun god, Sol in Victus, whose worship was instituted in the official state worship of the Roman calendar by the emperor Aurelian in the 3rd century CE. The unconquered sun god's festival day was December 25th, the day after the winter solstice in the Julian calendar, in honor of his birth on that date from a cliff. After he was born, shepherds brought him gifts. He maintained his spot on the sacred calendar of Rome until he was displaced by Christianity. Christianity even had to compete with religions that borrowed from Christianity. Another third century faith from Iran or Persia was Manichaeism, as preached by his prophet Mani, who, from his post between the Roman Empire and India, took elements from Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and Christianity, all of which, he argued, were not complete on their own. By 280 CE, the doctrine had reached Rome. It prospered until the 7th century and reached as far as China, where it lasted until the 14th century. The Church Father Augustine, canonized as St. Augustine, was himself an adherent of Manichaeism before converting to Christianity. Manichaeism was based on the Zoroastrian and Magian religious practices of Persia. It asserted a strict monotheism, but a dualist conception of the universe. Evil rules the material world. Our souls, however, are emanations of the light and goodness that is God, but they are trapped in material and thus evil bodies. God releases his light into the world, and we must engage in the fight against darkness and evil on the side of light and the good. Jesus was sent into the world as a messenger, but was not himself the answer. Alas, we begin to run out of time, and we have only begun to scratch the surface. The world in which Christianity developed remained full of gods, both ancient and innovative, and the Roman world made room, too, for competing monotheisms. From a historical perspective, it does not appear foreordained that Christianity or even monotheism would triumph over classical, traditional, and ancestral forms of worship. It was also possible that a form of monotheism might have prevailed that was less jealous, one that could permit and accommodate other forms of worship. But these alternative possibilities were not to be. 
Before Rome's empire fell in the West, Christianity became the state religion. How this came about and what fate awaited the myriads of gods and pagan ceremonies with histories stretching back so many generations over thousands of years will serve as the topic of our final lecture. Until the next time then, dear students of ancient religions and cult practices, may your studies as well as your nights and days prove auspicious.